in the book of Isaiah, and the message this morning probably is going to be a little different, but in the book of Isaiah, over I covered six chapters on Thursday. And don't panic. Uh, we won't be running into the 1115 service. But, but from beginning in Isaiah 7 all the way through Isaiah 12, um, I find that I want to leave with you this morning. I find four promises of God that you're going to memorize. I'm going to have you memorize them this morning, okay? You may think you're in a schoolroom, but that's just fine. I think you can handle it. You're going to memorize four truths that apply directly to you out of those six chapters of Isaiah, written 700 years before Jesus Christ was born. And if you're going to take notes, I want you to write this down. Here's the first one. It won't be very hard to memorize. Here's the first promise. We are not alone. We are not alone. Now, I get this from Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, where God, through the prophet Isaiah, is talking to a literal pagan king who is supposedly leading Israel, God's people, and there's nothing good to say about Ahaz. He's a, he, he really is a pagan apostate king. And yet God defends him and God sends Isaiah to talk to him. And at one point in Isaiah chapter 7, God says to, through Isaiah, to Ahaz, this apostate king, just ask me for a sign. Now, you know, we all know the scriptures that say don't test God. But when God invites you to ask him for a sign, he is dead serious about it. And Isaiah, the clown, Ahaz, the clown, sorry, not Isaiah. Ahaz, the clown, says no, he's not going to ask God for a sign. So Isaiah responds to Ahaz's reluctance to ask God for a sign. And he says, all right then, the Lord himself, verse 14, will give you a sign. Look, the virgin, not just any virgin or a virgin, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, I wish the slides were working for this particular reason. The theological dictionary of the New Testament defines the Hebrew and the Greek word used here for the word that's translated with Emmanuel, God with us. In the Greek, it is the word meta, M-E-T-A. And it literally means not just being present, but being in fellowship with and standing by to defend and there to help and guide. So Jesus is the gift of God, Emmanuel, God with us. And he's given as a sign even 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. But then when Matthew records the gospel account of the birth of Jesus, Matthew, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, goes straight to Isaiah 7, 14 and brings it into Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22. All of this, Jesus' birth, occurred, Matthew writes, to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Listen, folks, heaven has invaded earth. Heaven has come to earth. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven right now to experience a portion of heaven because Jesus has promised that he will be God with us to not just be present, but being in fellowship with and standing by to defend and there to help and guide you. We are not alone. We ran into, I can't remember who it was, 
We ran into somebody, oh, in the widow's lunch every December, Westgate honors the widows and widowers of Westgate with a luncheon. And at the widow's lunch, one of the widows said to me as I went around the tables to greet them, she said, this is the first time I've been out of my house in 19 months. We are not alone. And if some of you watching online are those who, for fear of your health out of concern, legitimate concern about your well-being and your health, you've just not ventured out, the good news of Christmas is you're not alone. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. He made that promise using that same language to Abraham when he had Abraham launch out from Ur the Chaldees to an unknown destination, through an unknown route, by unknown means. But he said to Abraham, as that man of faith launched out just at the word of God, he said to Abraham in Genesis 17, 4, he said to Abraham, don't be afraid, Abraham, I am am with you. He made the same promise to Jacob in Genesis 26, 3. He made the same promise to Moses in Exodus 3, 12, that he would be with him, that he wouldn't be alone, that he's not left to his own devices, that you're not left to your own wisdom because we serve a God who is with us, who's told us his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts as the heavens are above the earth. It's not our wisdom that gets us through. It's not our ingenuity. It's not our tenacity that gets us through. It is not, it's not our courage that gets us through. It's the fact that God is with us. We are not alone. I want you to memorize that phrase because I'm going to give you three others before we're done this morning. But here's the first one. We are not alone. In fact, God tells Joshua before he launches into the promised land, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live for I will be with you as I was with Moses which is just a marvelous way that scripture is telling us, look at what God did for the people he was with. (laughs) Look at the miracles God did for the people he was with. That's That's the guarantee and the evidence we need for the assurance that God will be with us because God said to Joshua, don't be afraid because just the same way I was with Moses, I will be with you. And then no surprise that when the angel appears to Mary in Luke 128, he says, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. And then when Jesus instructs his disciples what to do when he leaves this earth and ascends to the Father, he says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Or even when the apostle Paul is in, is in Corinth, frightened for his life, Jesus appears to him and says, don't be afraid, Paul, speak out, don't be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. We are not alone. We Say it with me out loud. We are not alone alone. Say it again. We are not alone. Now this promise comes with a little caution that I just thought about during worship and Pastor Evan helped me find it. But in the ESV speaking about King Asa who had some problems, started out faithful, started out marvelously faithful to God, but towards the end of his life, Asa started relying on his wisdom and strength. And so the Spirit of God comes on Azariah, 2 Chronicles 15, 1, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you are with him. That's just a little caution Because there's a gospel being preached in America today. 
And you hear it and see it in all kinds of venues. But there's a gospel out there that says, God loves you and his grace covers you and he accepts you just the way you are. There's no condemnation. And listen, all of those things are true. He does accept us just the way we are and he does love us and his grace does cover us. But that doesn't mean that we're excused to live any way we want to because he loves us so much. He doesn't leave us the way we are. And I find by and large that part of the gospel is being left out today. And that's some of the warning in my quiet time this morning. I'm in Colossians 1, and it says towards the end of Colossians 1, I think around verse 28, that Paul went on to preach the gospel with warnings. I thought, I even texted our whole family. I thought, that's curious to me, that Paul preached the gospel with warnings. Why would there need to be warnings? There needed to be warnings back then, and there need to be warnings now. Not the kind that make us fearful and so introspective that we're, 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 we are uh, hampered and, and crippled by our fear, but the kind of warning that says, yes, God loves us and embraces us, and his grace covers us, but he's still a holy God, and he's not meant Messing around. So he's with you. We are not alone. Remember that. Here's the next truth I get from Isaiah. I want you to write down. We are light. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I preached a lot of this last Sunday from Isaiah chapter 9. It's the second gem from Isaiah's teaching That really applies to us as a gift at this Christmas season and from the Christmas message. Uh, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And Isaiah 9 and verse 6 tells us the source of this light. For a child is born to us and a son is given to us. And the rest of Isaiah 9 lays out for us what a difference this light accomplishes in our lives. This yoke of slavery gets broken. You are no longer a slave to your sin. It's why Pastor Ron cautions the folks in Monday Night Healing and Recovery who come out of the 12-step program that are trained to say, I'm so-and-so and I'm a drunk. No, when you're set free by Jesus Christ, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He changes you into somebody you were not before. It's a change of heart which breaks the power of sin. And you are no longer the sin that defined you. So the yoke of slavery gets broken by this light. Burdens too heavy to carry get lifted by this light. All in chapter nine. The oppressor's rod gets shattered by this light. The internal war is over because of this light. So it's no surprise that when Jesus the son that was given to us arrives on this earth in John 8, 12. He says, I'm the light of the world. And if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. But when the miracle of new birth is revealed by the spirit to New Testament Christians, Paul writes this. This is an amazing verse. I wish this could be on the screen. Paul writes this to the Ephesian believers. For at one time, Ephesians 5, 8, for at one time, let this soak in, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So the source is still the Lord, right? But your radical DNA gets changed. You once were darkness. You didn't just live in darkness. You were darkness. But now Paul tells the Ephesian believers, and if you want to go home and read it, it's best in the ESV. But once you were darkness, now you are light in the Lord. So walk 
as children of light. So we are not alone. It's the first one. Ready? Say it with me. We are not alone. It's the gift of Christmas promised by the spirit through Isaiah. Second one, we are light. Would you say that both with me? We are not alone and we are light. Here's the third one. We have a king. <laughs> For a child is born to us, in chapter 9, verse 6. A son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and the passionate, I love this, the passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. The good news is we're not cut adrift. We have a king. We have a king. Now, there was a day and maybe you can say I've always been naive, and maybe I have. But there was a day in America not too many years ago that we lived with a somewhat naive innocence that those in government carried our best interests at, on their hearts as they went to city councils and to Olympia and to Washington, D.C., that they carried our best interests on their heart above even what they were thinking and their own ideologies. There was a time when those charged with the security of our nation, like the Department of Justice or the FBI or the intelligence agencies, were impartial and trustworthy. There was a time when breaking the law in this country would be met with swift punishment. There was a time when the law applied equally to all of its citizens. There was a time when judges could be trusted to rule without prejudice or without impartiality. And that the most vulnerable in our nation would be protected. And that the press was obsessed with finding and reporting the truth. But I doubt that there's anybody here this morning, after the last few years, who feels that any of these things can be counted on any longer. Kind of sad. Kind of disillusioning. When the accusation started to be made five years ago that there was a deep state in this country that was doing its own ideological thing, I dismissed, in my own heart, I dismissed all that. I thought, no, that can't be true. That's for the movies. Uh, but wow, we're beginning to learn that, that there, is, uh, there is corruption at some of the highest levels, and probably has been for a long time, from Watergate to Russiagate, right? There are games being played that we people who trust government and government agencies are beginning to be unsettled by the upheaval and the uncertainty that we see all around us. Now, I want you to know, I honestly believe that there is a massive revival coming. A revival of the church of Jesus Christ. For the real problem is not with the judiciary. And the real problem is not really in Washington, D.C., although they could stand revival also. But the real problem is that the church of Jesus Christ has lost its passion and love for God. And the decay in our nation, in every ill that you can think of this morning, the decay in our nation, I believe ties directly to a church and a pulpit that has fallen asleep. But what's happened is this naivete that at least I had that our government and all these agencies could be trusted has left me extremely unsettled. But Isaiah anticipated it. And he wrote out of the stump of David's family. Out of the stump, meaning what little is left 
of David, what appears to be dead in King David's family, will grow a shoot. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. And I would, I would add, has grown a shoot. A new branch, Isaiah writes, bearing fruit from the old root. David was the king to whom God promised there will always be a king out of your lineage on the throne. And to this day, there is a king of the lineage of David. His name is Jesus Christ. His miraculous birth into the lineage of David assures us that we have a king. And under his government right now, do we have a peace that will never end? Chapter 9 and verse 7. We have fairness and justice for all. Chapter 9 and verse 7. We have wisdom and understanding. Chapter 11 and verse 2. And we have the destruction of the wicked. Chapter 11 and verse 4. We have a government. And we have a king. And he, he rules over our heart. And we get to enter into and under his rule. Where we find safety in the midst of the upheaval in this nation. We find peace in the midst of the turmoil in this nation. We find certainty in the, much, in the midst of the fear that is plaguing this nation and the world right now. Why? Because we have a king. And he reigns in righteousness. And what we do here at Westgate every Sunday when we enter into worship is we exalt him. And we worship him. And we establish in our own hearts and families that he reigns and rules. There is a king. I want us to use that, come with that song in just a moment when we get done. There is a king. It is, his name is Jesus. And he comes just like Isaiah promised out of the lineage of David. So let's, let's review quickly, right? What's the first one? We're not alone. Second one. We are light. Third one, we have a king. Here's the final one. We have a future. Whatever happens in this country, we have a future. And under his government, we can look forward to an eternal kingdom and his eternal reign where, this is all in chapter 11, the wolf and the lamb will lie down together. The leopard will lie down with the goat, verse 6. The cow will graze near the bear, verse 7. The baby will play safely near the cobra's den, verse 8. The earth will be filled with people who know the Lord, verse 9. The heir to David's throne will be the banner of salvation to the whole world. We have a future. And it doesn't depend on Washington, D.C., and it doesn't depend on Olympia. And it doesn't depend on your circumstances, your physical health, your wealth or poverty. It doesn't depend on any of those things. You, we have a future. And it is safe and secure in the hands of our king. Don't live under intimidation. Don't let the news put you into perpetual fear. Don't hunker down somewhere and just wait till the rapture, waiting it out till the rapture. No, it's time for the sons and daughters of God to step into the fray, pick up the weapons of our warfare and begin to do battle for the kingdom of God and for each other. Why? Because we are not alone. We are light. We have a king and we have a future. And we'll be confident from Isaiah chapter 12, that in that day, chapter 12 and verse 1, you will sing, we will sing, I will praise you, O Lord. The Lord God is my strength and my song. He's given me victory. Sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. Make known his praise around the world. Let all the people of Jerusalem shout his praise and joy for great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among you. There's a song that we're going to sing. It's the song of the redeemed. 
and it has no bearing on anything we're going through right now. And it's all secure in the hands of Jesus Christ. And if you're in this service this morning and you've never given your life to him, you need it to get under the canopy of these promises right now. These promises don't apply to you right now unless you come by faith into the family of God and are able to say, I am not alone. I am the light. I have a king and I have a future. And if you're ready in your heart this morning to take that step of faith, since we don't have room in the altar area right now, I'm going to ask you as you exit, would you go to the information booth, please, at the center, outside the center doors, and just tell them you'd like to have a, an alpha packet because we want to be able to give you information about how you can secure your position in the family of God, in the kingdom of God that will not be shaken, that is eternal. And then when it comes in its fullness to this earth, we're going to live in a kingdom where there is no death and no sickness and no pain, and no corruption, and no dying, and no disease, and no fear, and no torment, and no oppression, and no racism, and no division, because the King reigns there. Bless His holy name. Bless His holy name.